Uh, good evening, good evening, good evening. It's 7 p.m. on a Monday evening. Um, so, Free University Brighton, philosophy class. Here we go. Um, whoa, look, there's the fellows. Uh, let's, uh, let's say hello, shall we? Hi, how are you doing? Free University Brighton, philosophy class, introduction to philosophy. This is the second of four classes um, and these are as I say introductory classes so they're for people who want to get a taste and a sense of what philosophy is about um, and they're for people who want to start studying philosophy it sort of give you some starting points and um, they're for anyone else who's just generally interested if you're in the Free University of Brighton then we will have a seminar at eight o'clock on Zoom, uh, this lecture should stop about five to eight, and we will have a five-minute break uh, during this time, sort of somewhere about half past half past seven. Um, I'm going to talk about David Hume today, um, and I'm also just going to say hi and thank you for all the follows recently. I've been asking for people to follow. I'm trying to get 50 followers to unlock some of the stuff that exists on Twitch. You need to have 50 followers. Um, so if you can give us a share or a follow or you know, encourage someone else to do that. That's great. It'll be really helpful. Um, anyway, so let's get on with today's stuff. So we're talking about David Hume. Um, now, David Hume, let's pull this over here a moment, actually. Let's put over here. David Hume, there he is. The little picture of David there. Um, David Hume exists, lives, um, thinks between 1711 and 1776. And if you want to go and find out a bit about his biography and all that kind of stuff, then Wikipedia is your friend. It's a good place to go um, and it can give you a good sort of grounding. And there's a couple of kind of key phrases um, that are very important for David Hume. Um, one, what well, very important if we're going to think about David Hume, uh, first is a thing called the problem of induction. Uh, the second is something called Hume's fork, uh, like a fork, you know, a fork in a path that goes two different ways. Not a fork that you eat with. That's what I always thought when I first heard that Hume's fork. It was like some special fork you eat with, but it's not. It means a fork in a path. And uh, the other is a phrase that he has that's that's a very David Hume phrase, and this is the phrase. This is the phrase constant. Thank you very much for the follow, Brockbank. Um, this is the phrase constant conjunction. Now, what David Hume is known for is essentially putting forward an argument that, um, in effect, undermines um, a kind of comfortable belief in causality. Um, so, instead of us, uh, inst instead of us like believing easily that it's actually a fact of the world that there's such a thing as causality, that you know, event A causes um, reaction or response B. Uh, what Hume is famous for is arguing that, in fact, this kind of sense of causality that we have is really um, not as clear and not as certain as we would like to believe. And in fact, what we're really living in is a kind of habit practice. We are kind of so used to constantly conjoining certain things together um, as though they always came together um, as to, you know, not really realize that 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 underlying that it's not exactly clear what's going on um, and that sometimes we take our habits for reasons um, and this is one of the interesting things about Hume this is one of the interesting things about Hume um, but let's begin by trying to look at because all of this kind of particularly this phrase constant conjunction all of this kind of comes back to uh, uh, a problem called the problem of induction So what we're going to be doing uh, is looking at Hume. This is an introductory look at Hume, obviously. Um, we can go into an enormous amount of depth. He's an extremely interesting philosopher in many ways, and, and there's been an awful lot written about him. But what we're going to do is essentially look look at a couple of little bits. So if you are studying this course, then the good thing to do is to obviously, particularly if you're at the Free University, um, particularly uh, if you want to kind of get the full range of what's going on, um, then the best thing to do is to obviously do some of the reading alongside the lectures. The lectures kind of go hand in hand with the reading. And in this case, it's not an enormous amount to read. Uh, it's from David Hume's most famous book, Inquiries of the Human Understanding, sections four and five. And section four is called Skeptical Doubts, 
concerning the operation of the understanding. Section 5, skeptical solution to these doubts. So that's where you're going to find the material if you want to look at it in a bit more depth. Now, David Hume, obviously writing in the 18th century, um, writes in a slightly odd language. Um, it won't be immediately, you know, immediately comfortable, but it's not really, it's not like reading Shakespeare and it's not like reading ancient Greek. It is relatively comfortable if you're familiar. Um, if you're familiar enough with the English language, it should be relatively comfortable. Um, but just bear in mind that it's, it's 18th century writing, so it's a little bit odd, but... Uh, one of the uh, ways in which this problem of induction is kind of expressed is in this very famous question that's kind of associated with David Hume, which is, how do we know the sun is going to rise tomorrow? Uh, now, <laughs> this sounds like a ridiculous question, right? It sounds like this kind of stupid question that philosophers make, and you wonder why on earth, you know, anyone would ever read them if they're. It's you know, it's kind of isn't it obvious that the sun is going to rise tomorrow? Um, but of course, what the philosopher is trying to do all the time, um, and we talked a little bit about this last week in terms of what philosophy is. What a philosopher is kind of trying to do all the time is look at the way we make connections between concepts. Um, between what we might call that thought rather than our thinking, sort of the structure of thought itself. And so David Hume is, 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 a, is a really key part of this process because he um, brings forward a certain scepticism towards reason, but more importantly, a certain scepticism towards things that reason takes for granted. For example, the, the relationship of causality. And he does this um, by kind of unpicking uh, the, tenuous, the tenuousness of some of the connections that we want to make. And so we're going to look in, in some detail, hopefully, uh, at the way in which this kind of process works, the way in which he examines and checks some of our connections. So why on earth would anyone sort of um, raise this question? Well, part of the reason for raising the question of, you know, why will the sun rise tomorrow? Part of the reason for raising that question is to think about the way in which the knowledge we have of today is projected into the future. And to think about the difficulties involved in that. What, what might be involved in that? Um, now, that's not just to say... You know, something as simple as, as you know, the, the, the sun rising tomorrow, that knowledge of the future, that kind of predictability of the world um, depends upon knowledge uh, in, in the here and now and knowledge in the past. And so there's this kind of interesting temporal relationship that we set up when we say we can predict something. Um, we set up a relationship such that what we know here, what we experience here in, in the everyday world um, and within uh, at the, the, the way in which we can connect experiences of the everyday world through our reason, what we experience here um, is projected into the future in some sense forever, you know. Um, and so this applies m most commonly to the way in which we think about things like scientific laws. Because obviously when we think about a scientific law, although we kind of are aware that most of them come into um, expression, that most of them are kind of discovered um, at a certain point, you know, and before that we didn't know them, what we kind of think is that these laws just exist. They're just part of the way the world is. And in fact, that's probably not a bad way of thinking about them. That's, that's you know, um, that's not a terrible way of thinking about them. And, and, and someone like Hume is not necessarily, you know, denying um, his point is not to sort of say science is wrong. What his point is to say is that, is that the reasoning behind this is not as clear as we might at first think. Um, and the certainty in particular uh, with which some people um, assert certain laws or certain predictabilities um, with, with regard to the future, that certainty they have is definitely not rationally justified. Um, and so what he would argue in a sense is that uh, if we examine our reasoning, what we find is that we are always really talking about probabilities rather than certainties. Now, if you remember from last week when we talked about Descartes, uh, Descartes was fascinated and interested in this idea of reaching some kind of certainty. Uh, and he reached this through a process of scepticism. 
Here, of course, Hume is also using a process of scepticism, but in this situation to try and shift our conceptual frameworks. He's not trying to um, find certainty, but he's trying to, as it were, reorganize the way in which we think about uh, things that we would like to be certain of. He's trying to reorganize the way we think. And it's interesting that, that this process um, that philosophy is engaged in at this point uh, is a process that's very focused on what reason can do. Um, now, modern philosophy arises with someone like Descartes and Hume. It arises in this kind of discussion, in a sense, between two different types of philosophy, between rationalist philosophy and empiricist philosophy. And we'll look at that a little bit more in, 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 uh, as we go through. But what's going on with both of them? What they're all trying to explore is, in a sense, um, the role of reason in the transition from a theologically orientated world, a world in which belief in God is th that which organizes our lives and our thinking, into a secular world um, where uh, reliance on God is no longer any you know, uh, any justification for um, our beliefs um, and instead reliance on reason um, is coming to the fore. And so modern philosophy begins in this kind of struggle to work out what it is that reason can do. And it reaches the end of, as it, as it were, the first phase, not with David Hume or with René Descartes, um, but with someone called uh, Immanuel Kant. Um, and Immanuel Kant um, is, is at the end of the 1800s, uh, sorry, he's, he's, at, he's sort of late in the 1800s, uh, in, in the 1700s, sorry, late in the 1700s, um, around the time of the French Revolution. Um, and one of the things that Immanuel Kant does is, is establish this kind of separation, a very clear separation between the realm of reason and the realm of faith. Um, and he does this in some sense to kind of resolve the arguments and the disputes that have occurred in philosophy between rationalists and empiricists who have been arguing about um, the role of reason um, in large part because they are trying to work out what role reason has um, within the world in, in which they live where God and belief in God is the dominant thought process, the dominant conceptual scheme. So what we actually have in the birth of modern philosophy is this kind of disengagement, um, eventually disengagement with religion. Um, but it begins um, uh, by engaging with, uh, it begins in a process of engaging with, with uh, questions about how far reason can go. And David Hume's um, contribution to this is the problem of induction. Now, what is induction? Induction is different. It's a particular form of reasoning, um, and it's distinct from deduction. Now, deduction or deduction is not really what um, Sherlock Holmes does. He doesn't, even though he, he may use the phrase, you know, um, that he's deducing things. Deduction is what we might think of as a kind of pure reasoning, a reasoning about things in the abstract, um, and a reasoning about things in such a way that, um, you know, B follows A. There's certain things that follow other things, and we kind of uh, kind of try and work out what those connections are. Um, but it's quite abstract. It's not usually to do with the world so much. It's usually to do with relationships between things, what um, Hume is going to call relationships between ideas. And it's something that is... Um, in a sense, exemplified by things like mathematics and geometry. That, those are deductive systems. And so when Euclid develops his uh, geometrical um, uh, theorems, he's deducing them from certain starting points, what are called axioms, um, at things that you take as kind of self-certain self um, starting points that everyone, you know, that are so simple, everyone believes and we can't really not believe. And then you work out the consequences. And this is the process of deduction. Now, induction is a slightly different process because it does deal with the world. It deals with things around us and it deals with um, what we might call patterning. But specifically, induction is when we reason from cases to generalities. Um, 
So uh, the most, one of the most famous <laughs> examples of this is this idea that, you know, there are certain statements we might make that are generalities. Um, a statement such as all ravens are black, for example. But we make these generalities um, not just on their own. They're part of a kind of system of inference. So inference is the way you move from one statement to another. Deduction is one form of inference and induction is another form of inference. And so when we, when we make a statement like all ravens are black, um, there is implicit in that some inference and the inference is uh, from the fact that every raven we happen to see every case of seeing a raven um, is such that we see it and we realize acknowledge experience the raven to be black and we might see lots and lots and lots of ravens there might be hundreds and hundreds of these cases that we can cite i've seen you know ravens throughout my life every single time i've seen a raven it's been black and we kind of then make this jump. We infer that every single raven I've seen so far has been black. Therefore, all ravens are black. And so we go from the cases to generalities. And the issue is with that kind of from, that from to movement, that from to relationship. That's an inference from something. Every single raven I have seen um, is black to something else all ravens are black and what david hume is is really focused on is looking at all of the different ways in which this uh, inductive inference um, is carried out and looking at in essentially the difficulties here this is why it's a skeptical account he's trying to essentially say that that inference is not one that um, is as obvious as it might seem and in fact the lack of obviousness um, is in a sense what he's trying to suggest what he's trying to produce um, in his arguments now we have to kind of wind back a little bit at this point and we have to try and make some uh, some distinctions um, in a, in a broad sense. So broadly speaking, there are two kinds of philosophy at the birth of modern Western philosophy. There are two kinds of methods, two answers, if you like, to the question, um, how should we reason? Um, how do we know things with reason? One answer is uh, the rationalist answer, and the other is the empiricist answer. And so we have this kind of two strands of philosophy that are developing, a rationalist strand and an empiricist strand. Um, now, the rationalists, the people like Descartes, um, uh, also Leibniz and Spinoza, those are the three kind of most important rationalists that most people encounter, Descartes, Leibniz and Spinoza. The rationalists, they essentially argue that our knowledge comes from reasoning. That's the primary source of our knowledge. It, because it comes from reasoning, it can give us certainty. And as long as we are careful and we make our inferences step by step, slowly pay attention to them, you know, challenge and think about them, as long as we're careful, that chain of reasoning can lead, um, in some cases, all the way up to God, all the way up to um, knowledge claims about God. And this is what people like Spinoza, for example, um, are very famous for doing. Now, on the other hand, the empiricists... Uh, thank you for the follow, Lorraine. The empiricists are, um, have, have a different account of where our knowledge comes from. They don't think reason can give us... Uh, uh, you know, can give us all of our knowledge. They don't think it's useless. They don't they, remember. They're all discussing, you know, how we use reason. Um, but what the empiricists say is that is that the source of our knowledge is fundamentally experience. This is what empiricist means. It means, in a sense, um, uh, experience uh, t coming from experience. So, if you want to empirically check something, you will go out and carry out some kind of experiment. You will go out and produce a situation in which you can experience uh, the result you won't sit down 
and reason about it. Um, you won't sit, if you like, in, the, in that terrible phrase, in your armchair, reasoning about the world. You'll go out and look at the world. You'll go out and measure it. You know, you'll go out and observe. That's fundamentally what you do. So the empiricists think that the, you know, source of our knowledge is is experience. The rationalists think that the source of our knowledge is reason. So that's the basic distinction. That's the kind of, you know, we've got two lines of, of thinking, two answers to, to what, what is reason for? How do we use it? Um, you've got the, you know, where does our knowledge come from? Um, and what role does reason play in our knowledge? You've got these two different kind of answers, uh, the empiricist and the rationalist. But within empiricism, you have two different kinds of empiricists. And Hume is a radical empiricist. He, he's... He's the most thoroughgoing, you know, um, you know, hard bitten, you know, completely harsh, you know, solid empiricist. Uh, and the way in which we want to make this distinction between these two kinds of empiricists is we're going to call one what we call content empiricism, in which what they're essentially saying is that all our ideas, all the kind of you know, thoughts that we have about the world. So when we think about a dog or when we think about the color red or, you know, when we think about a tree, you know, the ideas there, the idea of the dog or the color red or the tree, that idea has come from experience. We've kind of learnt it from our being in the world. Um, but what they also argue, these content empiricists, is that that's not the only source of our knowledge. We can also kind of reason about the relationships between those ideas. Um, now, what Hume does um, is kind of radicalise this, and he essentially says, "Well, even if we were to reason about things, um, uh, you know, the source of which is our experience, um, there is no knowledge of the world that we can have with certainty." And this is his strong claim. The content empiricist is not committed to that. They can kind of, you know, uh, in a sense, argue um, that although. You know, our ideas of the world have come from our experience and our lived experience in the world. We can kind of make rational judgments still about the world. And those rational judgments will be about the world and they can give us, you know, certainty about that knowledge. Um, Hume, on the other hand, is basically saying, no, there is no knowledge of the world with certainty. Um, and so he's he's radically undermining in a much stronger way um, the kind of sense we can have of our own capacity and what it is we can do with our reasoning and, and the limits of our knowledge. Now that phrase limits of knowledge is actually not something that Hume uses but he begins to bring up this problem of what are the limits of our knowledge. It's Kant, Immanuel Kant, who will actually focus heavily on that idea of what are the limits of our knowledge and he will take that and try and answer that in a book called The Critique of Pure Reason. We're not going to be able to get to Kant really because it's a little bit too um, specific but that's that's the kind of line of development if you, if you like, you know, this kind of discussion about our knowledge, what role reason plays in it, what role experience plays in it and various different answers and the vast majority of people are trying to find ways to make our knowledge sort of certain and sure and fixed, but Hume is coming along and undermining that certainty, and he's undermining it as an empiricist. And unlike a lot of other empiricists, he is, um, his main kind of focus is not simply on in answering where does our knowledge come from, but his, his focus is on uh, and what are the limits of that, what can't we do with it. And he famously, he comes up with this thing, as I said, called Hume's Fork. I remember this is, you know, this kind of fork in the road, not, not the fork you eat with. Before we get to Hume's Fork, which is what we're going to end up on, um, let's deal a little bit with content empiricism and knowledge empiricism. Um, let's look at those in a little bit more detail, see if we can just flesh them out, because it's a little bit strange, they're a little bit odd, it's not entirely, you know, it's not entirely obvious perhaps. So this, this enables us to look at this process that I spoke about last week, sometimes I, I describe this um, following Simon Blackburn I believe actually, uh, sometimes I describe this as what, what we can call conceptual engineering. Um, and so if you imagine that our, that thought is a kind of complex network of concepts, 
joined together with various inferences, various relationships, um, then the philosopher is kind of examining how, the, how that you know, operates, how that system operates, and perhaps trying to re-engineer bits of that system as we think it operates, trying to make it work um, a little bit more uh, efficiently perhaps, trying to make us understand how it works maybe a little bit more clearly, um, and maybe making us sort of you know, um, understand quite what we can do, quite what we can't do. And so this this is going to sort of this is going to seem a little bit of a strange thing but one of the things we keep one of the key things we do is we kind of we we try as philosophers to look at these things we call inferences the connections between statements and we try and look at what's involved in that and what we're missing quite often what we're missing what what we haven't really noticed before so let's look at this this is a very famous thing if you were to, if you do an introduction to philosophy course in any kind of university um, around the world, you're probably going to come across this, what's called a syllogism, um, which is a kind of structure of an argument. Um, and so we have three statements. They all follow one from the other. So it's like one, two, three. The first statement is all humans are mortal. The second is that I am a human. And the third is an inference that we can make. We can tell that it's an inference um, because it's using the word therefore. Um, uh, so what comes after that, therefore, um, is dependent upon what goes before it. And so we're kind of making this joined up connection. And the, a good inference, you know, a good statement that has a good strong inference is going to tell us something after that, therefore, that we didn't really know before. And so as you can see, all humans are mortal, I am a human. It's not saying in that, the statements are not saying I am mortal. That's an inference that's going to be made. Now, it, it's such an obvious inference that it might seem difficult for you to, re, to, not, to, to sort of say, well, it, yeah, but that was already implied, wasn't it? And when you say something like that, when you say, but that was already implied, what you're kind of saying is, I already have that inference. I've already made that inference. And what we're trying to do as philosophers is slow you down. You know, when you say something like that was implied in what you said, what we're trying to do is slow you down so that you can actually look at the way in which that implication, um, which is another kind of term for inference, inference and implication are quite close, not synonymous exactly, but they're quite closely, you know, quite closely connected. We're trying to slow you down and go, well, actually, just let's let's try and, you know, um, really just pay attention to what's involved when you say that that's implied. So let's have a look just at that connection. What are the kind of key words here? Well, some very important words, and one, if you're gonna be a philosophy student, you should, like, they should go off like Belisha beacons, you know, they should flash red when you see these kind of words, are uh, phrases or words like all or therefore. And in that first statement, Let's just bring this up briefly for you. In that first statement, what you can see here is all humans are mortal. And this word all is this is what we might call a quantifying word. Don't worry too much about the jargon. What that would mean is we're working out what's included in a particular set of humans. So the particular group that we're talking about is humans. And the word all here is saying every single human, no matter where they are, no matter when they live, if they are going to be included in the group that we call human, um, then they are going to have, they are, we're ascribing a property to these things. All humans, everyone that's ever going to be a human, you know, they're going to have this property of being mortal. Now, this next sentence, I am a human, this is an identification sentence. So we've kind of sort of said, well, here's a general statement about um, the class of things that we call humans. The group of things, if you like, that we call humans. Um, and we're going to give that group, we're going to say that, that every single one of them is going to have this particular property, in this case being mortal. And then we're going to say, um, and I've got a particular human here. I've got a case of, of a human. Um, and therefore, one of the things I, you know, that, you know, can, can do is, is, you know, uh, say that something like, um, 
if every single human has this property and I've got a case of the human here, then this human must also have this property. And this is what the inference is. Um, the, therefore, the drawing of the conclusion. Now, that seems like you know enormously nitpicky, doesn't it? I mean, I can understand how it is quite strange for a lot of people. It seems like you're going, you know, more than just splitting hairs and and and, you know, and, and like you know, like looking at some ridiculous detail. It looks like we're, we're doing something that seems kind of, I don't know, um, <laughs> absurd in a way. It looks slightly absurd. But remember, this is just an example um, so that we can begin to learn the method. Okay, so this is in the same way that when you first learn to play a musical instrument, you're not really going to make a lot of music. You know, you're going to find out what um, a particular key on the piano sounds like and you're going to realize that one is you know got a slightly lower sound than another and you're going to begin to get relationships between those keys together and then someone might talk to you about scales or they might talk to you about octaves or fifths um, and you might begin to then sort of build up a stronger and stronger picture of these relationships well it's a kind of similar thing that we're doing with concepts um, and concepts are expressed in words and they're expressed in the way in which we connect you know um, various different words together so that connection all humans are mortal is connecting a concept of the human with a property of mortality um, and that's that's a knowledge claim this is a knowledge claim um, when we say I am a human this is also a knowledge claim and saying I know what this thing is here in front of me this particular thing and so we've got two different bits of knowledge here a knowledge claim about you know the properties that are ascribed to all, all humans and we've got another knowledge claim about the thing in front of us and if we kind of put them together we can tell something about this thing in front of us we can draw a conclusion so what we're doing is we're trying to set up this kind of methodology and it, it, it will enable us it will be a kind of one of our tools um, that we can use when we're beginning to look at uh, complex arguments that are expressed in everyday language we will try and extract from those um, paragraphs that we're reading we'll try and see you know where the knowledge claims are where claims about all are or where claims about some are um, and we we'll essentially identify well that's a knowledge claim that's quantifying you know putting a property on something we'll try and see where identification claims are and we'll try and see where um, conclusions are being drawn and we'll try and see sometimes w when we look at a conclusion whether there were prior to that conclusion you know these steps that might be needed now a lot of this is kind of semi-intuitive in a sense because we're doing this all the time you know we're not this is not like some philosophers are not teaching you to do something you don't already do what we're trying to do is um, get you to step back a bit and pay closer attention to something that you're already doing and so this is why we want to kind of typologize we want to give names to types of things that we're encountering um, so we can kind of look at the differences here the check on the connection so in a sense we've got um, you know on the left on this side uh, on this side we've got things that we're talking about in the world and on this side we've kind of now formalized this we're sort of saying this is the skeleton structure of the argument but there's an important distinction that we're going to need to draw here so obviously this is kind of what we're basically saying is all a are b the quantification x is an a identification therefore x is a b conclusion but one of the things that's happened here, and this is going to be crucial for David Hume's, for understanding David Hume, one of the things that's happened here is on this side, this is pure reason. Okay? This is a kind of set of relationships. It doesn't really matter what A or B is, or, you know, in a sense, what X is. The way in which this is set up is absolutely pure reason. Um, we're kind of basically going something like, you know, um, you know, a, a math is a, it's, it's closer to a kind of mathematical relationship here but over here those kind of pure relationships have content that exists in the world um, and it's going to be the kind of distinction between that pure reason and the stuff that we've got in the world um, that we want to actually know something about um, that's going to be central to David Hume's uh, difficulty 
And so David Hume's difficulty, as I said, is called knowledge empiricism. And we're going to take a five minute break uh, before we come back and look a little bit more specifically about that. Um, so uh, it's 7.34 at the moment, according to my clock. I'm going to be back at 7.35, 7.39. And so in the meantime, go and have a drink, grab a glass of water, have a walk about, you know, stretch your arms. Try and sort of think over what's been said so far. Wonder if there's any questions you might want to bring up in seminars, etc., etc. Um, and I'll be back in five minutes. Okay, it's um, 
let's let's settle back into it so let's just recap a little bit um, modern philosophy Western philosophy is trying to work out how it can use reason what the method is um, it has two basic approaches to answering this question rationalists on the one hand um, we can use reason to get certain absolutely fixed knowledge um, and we can use this to replace our knowledge of God or various other things and there's another kind of answer which is empiricism which is no we can't use reason um, because most of our knowledge comes from experience of the world um, and while we might be able to use reason to sort of talk about different relationships between them uh, actually the source of knowledge is experience so rationalists the source of knowledge is reason empiricists the source of knowledge is experience David Hume is an empiricist but unlike most empiricists like John Locke or Thomas Hobbes David Hume is what we could call a knowledge empiricist um, where he doesn't just think it's the content that comes from experience he thinks uh, actually all of our knowledge is kind of limited by experience this is a kind of different slightly different notion so David Hume's problem most famously called the problem of induction um, but expressed in various different ways one of which is called Hume's fork David Hume's problem is a combination of two different thoughts the first is that statements about the relationships of ideas are only capable of being used deductively if their opposite implies a contradiction now what does that mean um, relationships of ideas these are the things that reason can tell us something about and a relationship of ideas can be identified um, can be used to make an inference uh, if as it were we made the opposite inference and found that it was a contradiction so let's talk the relationship of ideas between the concept triangle and the property of how many sides does a triangle have well um, a triangle has three sides and so if there's something in a sense that, that sort of uh, if we try and make a, a deduction in which we would say something like or the result of which would be something like triangles don't have three sides we know that there's a there's an error in the in the logic there um, and those kind of relationships of ideas uh, they're, ne they're necessary truths they're fixed almost now the, how they're fixed is kind of difficult to pin down and this is where a lot of the difficulties that philosophy points to a lot of the kind of intricacies come from how is it the case or why do we know it's the case that triangles have got three sides you know what is it about that particular knowledge claim how is it secured is, is it something we just have to take for granted well you know philosophers don't want to take it for granted um, but one of the things we can tell about it is that it, it's kind of all bound up together so there's no possibility of us saying um, all triangles do not have three sides there's a kind of necessity to the statement the source of that necessity as I say is is up for dispute it's up for argument but one of the things we can also say about that statement all triangles have three sides is we don't ever need to experience a triangle to be able to say this um, we know it before we ever encounter a triangle in fact the statement itself kind of defines what it is that we would even be able to experience as a triangle if something didn't have three sides if it had four then we wouldn't experience it as a triangle we'd experience it as a square we'd think of it as a square and so there's a kind of intricate binding between these different elements the concept triangle the number of sides it's got and kind of fixed together and now some people argue um, that this is to do with the sort of way in which we've defined something so the definition of a bachelor is that it's an unmarried man um, and so all we're really doing they would argue is kind of unpacking the definition other people argue that the properties of being an unmarried man or having three sides are kind of connected in by necessity to the concept of triangle um, these seem like very fine distinctions and they are in a sense quite fine distinctions um, and they, but the necessity that comes with them isn't fine it's a kind of thing that we encounter with quite a force 
Now, remember that they're talking in the context of um, reason and its relationship to theology, to God, and they're extracting themselves from a background of belief in God. And one of the first things that reason tries to do is, in a sense, try and sh- sort of bolster belief in God. It tries to give reasons for what might be sometimes called the necessary existence of God. Um, and so necessity doesn't just have this abstract role. You know, it has this kind of uh, important place because if we could ha- make a statement about God that was similar to the statement about triangles, then we wouldn't need to have belief. Um, we wouldn't need to, as it were, have, there would be no option in a sense. The necessity would force us to believe in God's existence if we could find a way in which some kind of knowledge claim about God could be made that was equivalent to the statement that triangles have got three sides. So the idea of necessity is what's really motivating the problem underneath of all this. What makes a particular statement necessary and what kinds of statements can be made to be necessary? Now what David Hume is going to say is that statements that are necessary, statements that we can identify as um, capable of being used deductively, um, are always statements about relationships between ideas. The idea of the triangle and the idea of the number of sides it's got. The relationship there is a necessary one. But the relationships between ideas, whilst they can be found to be necessary, are never about the world. We can't say anything actually about the world. And when he's saying about the world, one of the things that's implicit there is about God. We can't say anything about God, for example, with necessity. And he says that's one kind of statement, the relationships of ideas. And they can have absolute necessity. On the other hand, the other kinds of statements that we encounter in our knowledge are statements of matters of fact. It is dark outside at the moment. It is raining outside. I am a human, etc. These are statements of matters of fact. Now, a matter of fact um, can always be contradicted. Um, and so these two different elements, these relationships of ideas and these matters of facts, there's a kind of there's, there's different properties that we can ascribe to these. It's not going to be a contradiction for me to say that it's not dark outside if it's the middle of the day. It's not going to be a contradiction for me to say a whole bunch of things, you know, uh, uh, with regard to a, a matter of fact, it is raining. You know, if I say it is not raining, that's not a contradiction. There's no difficulty there. The way in which we tell whether one is true or not is by going and checking. We go and look, is it raining outside? If someone's to say to me that all triangles do not have three sides, then I can say that they're wrong because that's a contradiction. I don't need to check anything. I just know um, I can argue that this very relationship of ideas is such that it's not possible. And so this kind of distinction between the two different kinds of knowledge claims that we can have, relationships of ideas and matters of fact, this is Hume's fork. And his problem is a combination of these two kind of thoughts together. He sort of made this kind of type, these different types of knowledge claims that we have. And he's kind of then drawing an inference from these different types of knowledge claims. And one of the things that he implies is that no deductive inferences can be made about statements of matters of fact. They kind of separate it out. The contrary of every matter of fact is still possible because it can never imply a contradiction. These are his words. And what he does with this is, um, and you can see the kind of theological background and the kind of, you know, the problem that he's, he's working with. What he does with this is he makes this very famous statement right at the end of the first book of his inquiry. I'll just bring them up for you so that you can see that in a little bit more detail. When we run over libraries persuaded of these principles, the principles of these the Hume's fork, these two kinds of knowledge claims, when we run over libraries persuaded of these principles, what havoc must we make? If we take in our hand any volume of divinity or school metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? These are the relationships of ideas. No. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matters of fact and existence? No. Commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. So there's another inference here, and it's perhaps one that we need to be quite sort of 
careful with. Hume is essentially saying that all knowledge is of two types and of two types only. There is relationships of ideas primarily to do with uh, quantity and number, so geometry and mathematics primarily. So there's relationships of ideas and we can know stuff about that. Um, and we can know stuff about that with a kind of certainty. Um, uh, we can know something about you know, relationships between geometrical concepts with certainty because we can find out when we're going wrong because we'll, we'll produce contradictions. Um, and so we can know stuff about relationships of ideas and we can know it with some certainty. On the other hand, the only other kind of knowledge we have is matters of fact. And matters of fact always are you know, coming from experience. They're always coming from testing things. They're always coming from, you know, as he says, experimental reasoning. Um, and every single statement we make about a matter of fact could be wrong. And that includes statements that don't look like matters of fact, such as all ravens are black. Um, but in fact, this is a statement that's a matter of fact. It's not about uh, numbers. It's not about geometrical forms. It's about things out in the world. It's about experience. Therefore, it must be a matter of fact. Um, when we say something like all humans are mortal, it seems like we're saying something that's a kind of rational statement about the concept of the human. But in fact, it's not. It's about the, the matter of fact of what it is to be a human. And in both cases, when we use the concept all, when we say all humans are mortal or all ravens are black, um, we go wrong. Uh, we go fundamentally wrong. We can't say this. We have to, in a sense, say something a little bit more cautious, like, as far as we know, all humans are, uh, you know, uh, are mortal. As far as we know in our experience so far, all ravens are black. But our experience so far cannot tell us anything about our experience tomorrow. And this comes back to the question of why, why would the sun rise tomorrow? In our experience so far, it's always risen tomorrow. But that tells us nothing about experience tomorrow. Um, it tells us nothing about what's actually going to happen. There's always the possibility um, that that statement, that the sun will rise tomorrow, can be contradicted. In other words, there's always the possibility that the statement, the sun will rise tomorrow, whilst true today, can be wrong and false tomorrow. Now, it's interesting, if you look at that particular statement that he's made there, this is, as I say, at the end, this is kind of his conclusion. What he's trying to do is he's trying to exclude things. He's going to commit things to the flames. I mean, this is book burning. I mean, this is harsh stuff. This is not, you know, this is not like some little argument that he's having in which he can just go home afterwards. He's really quite harsh here. The claim is, is that if, it's, if, if what you find in a text, if what you find in a book is not relationships of ideas between, let's say, numbers or geometrical concepts, and it's not matters of fact about stuff in the world that's you know given to us with evidence about experiments, if it's neither of those, then it's sophistry, it's rubbish, it's not knowledge. And he's trying to kick stuff out of the realm of knowledge. He's trying to push it aside and turn it into fiction. He's trying to turn it into sophistry. He's trying to turn it into something else. He's trying to essentially say the way in which we deal with this um, must be very clear. Whatever it is, it's not knowledge. It might be a description of what you believe. It might be a description of what other people believe. It might be a description of the way in which you want the world to be. It might be a description of a whole kind of you know important ethos to you it might be all sorts of things but what it's not is knowledge knowledge has only two forms matters of fact and relationships of ideas everything else is something else now this kind of key problem um kicks into this concept of causality because when we say something like you know um you know if I, if I hit this billiard ball and it hits that other billiard ball, it's always going to do it in this particular way. This is always, this, this input is always going to get that output. Um, well, what we've got there is again, this, this universalizing, generalizing statement. It's always going to, all, every time. All of these kind of phrases are quantifying every single case into one, um, one law. All of these kind of cases um, 
do, you know, are, are essentially making claims not just about the experience we've had so far, but about any possible experience we could ever have. And this is, again, to kind of mix up a little bit, because that phrase, any possible experience, is one that comes from Kant. Again, Kant um, arises in some sense out of David Hume. Um, he says that David Hume awoke him from his metaphysical slumbers. He kind of awakes and awakens, you know, Kant because of this radical relationship to knowledge. This is why it's called knowledge empiricism. This radical relationship to knowledge in which he essentially is saying, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there that presents itself as knowledge, but that is not. Um, and the reason it's not is because knowledge is only in these two forms, relationships of ideas and matters of fact relationships of ideas like mathematics and geometry matters of fact about what the world is like and and what kind of things i can experience now this is a kind of skeptical account that obviously for hume pushes out things like knowledge about god this is not a we can't experience god in that sense he would argue we can't test it we can't empirically check him we can't measure his height or his weight or any of these kind of things we can't, you know, check where his birth certificate's from or, you know, or check his DNA or her DNA. So we can't really, you know, there's no experience we can have of God in that sense. Um, and it's obviously not a question of, of numbers and geometry. So it's not a relationship of ideas. Um, and so on the one hand, we've sort of pushed, pushed God out of the side. And it's, it's, this is now theology or divinity, as he calls it here. But on the other hand, we've also caused a problem for scientific uh, scientific predictions for laws, in particular things like causality. And so what is it we should do? Should we just dump causality? Should we dump, um, should we dump like the capacity to kind of discern patterns, in, which is in some sense one of the things that, that science is doing? You know, um, how can we draw inferences towards the future from experiences we have today if this problem of induction is real and deduction can tell me nothing about the world well hume's answer is that well what we do is we have to examine habits and customs we have a whole set of habits and customs the constant conjunctions that we encounter um, and we have belief about certain things and the kind of way in which we in in encounter these cost th these customary conjunctions and we have um more importantly uh kind of feelings of association so some things are almost impossible for us to disassociate so causality kind of comes into this we're encountering something that it's it's almost impossible for us to disassociate we can't but have the feeling of association between a cause and an effect and that's absolutely fine. It's not a problem for Hume. It's only a problem if we don't recognize that that sense of cause and effect is a kind of habit with an incredibly strong belief that we wouldn't perhaps even know how not to believe in. But it's important to recognize that it's a belief and not a knowledge. And now that's something that he, he's, it, it's a kind of, it's a fine distinction. But what it does is it just alters um, the kind of, uh, power that certain statements have and the implications that we can draw from them and the kind of force that they have over us and this is one of the things that the philosophers are arguing about at this time is the force of reason over the human um, and this also has a very strong implication and we're not really going to talk about this at all tonight unfortunately but this is where we would go with Hume it has a very strong implication for moral arguments um, and I'll just finish with this one of the most famous phrases from David Hume and this is one you can think about um, yourself is that there is no ought from an is um, in other words if it is somehow wrong for me to kill someone um, there's no way in which I can derive an ought from this um, there's, I can describe the experience and I can you know judge the experience but I can't derive a law a moral law from those particular processes and it's the same kind of process so we can't as it were you know derive a certainty towards the future a certainty towards something particularly with regard morality from cases that we judge in the here and now and so Hume's um, 
uh, Hume's kind of restriction of what it is we can know and how we can know it and, and the importance of things like belief applies not just to science, not just to religion, but to morality as well. And next week, we're going to be looking a little bit at morality. We're going to look at the three kind of basic accounts of morality that are given inside philosophy. Hume's not going to be coming up hugely there, but one of the things that is important is, as I say, this kind of way in which we make an inference, the way in which we draw a conclusion towards the future. And Hume has uh, scepticism towards science, scepticism towards religion, and scepticism towards morality, and all of those. Not that they don't exist, but just that our beliefs are far more important than we realise. Okay, that's it for today. I'm going to uh, start the Zoom seminar for those people in the Free University of Brighton. Um, uh, I will catch up with you next week, and we'll be looking a little bit at morality. Hopefully, I'll be in a, a new room next week, and I, I may I may even be able to start streaming during during the week a little bit more, as well as just classes. And so there may be some other discussions that we can have. But in the meantime, think well, and uh, I'll see you soon.